coming to you from the home of the mini trees. Inspirational, motivational, so come along with us. Hey everyone, welcome back to Pixel Talk. This week's edition brings you an interview with Mr. Jeff Dean, a Google Senior Fellow. A new exclusive song by The Fire Club. 60 seconds of interesting world news by Zuba Alam. And an interview with Peyton Robertson by Shannon Madden. As one of Google's earliest engineers, Jeff Dean helped create the fundamental systems that power Google every day, and is currently leading the team on TensorFlow, Google's artificial intelligence engine. Because of his coding prowess, Mr. Dean has been the subject of Google's internal April Fool's Day jokes. Here are a few. Jeff Dean's pin is the last four digits of pi. When Graham Bell invented the telephone, he saw a missed call from Jeff Dean. There's no control key on his keyboard. Jeff Dean is always in control. My name is Tej Singh. I'm representing Stanford OH as students from around the globe. So, hello world. Along with us here today is Mr. Jeff Dean. So, Mr. Dean, I I've heard great, we've all heard great things about you and your talent, especially at programming. How did you become so good and where, how'd you start? Um, so, I got into programming at a fairly early age. Um, Actually, my father, who's a physician, was always kind of interested in computing as a way to sort of improve healthcare. And so when the first personal computers were coming out, he bought a kit computer, uh, an IMSI 8080, which is a very, maybe a year or two before the Apple II came out as a computer. Um, and so he kind of assembled that. And at that time, I was nine years old. So I kind of like stared on and watched him solder things. And then eventually we got it working and I started to kind of play with it um, and just kind of enjoyed writing uh, computer games. So there was a big book of computer game programs you could get and type in and basic. Uh, so that was kind of my first introduction and I would type them in and then modify them. And um, I've always kind of enjoyed programming as a way of solving problems. You know, I think it's very nice and that you have this very interactive way of taking something you've done and changing it in, in various ways and very quickly kind of being able to like make something different or new or extend, extend it in some way. So, so at, at when you were, I think it's I think you, there's a little echo if you want to mute your side. So when you first started, obviously Google wasn't around. So well, what was your dream job or what company did you work in? Was it a healthcare? Because uh, they have a great story of you uh, developing a software for the World Health Organization like that would predict in, uh, the spread of malaria, uh, HIV and AIDS. So, so what was your dream job ideally when you first uh, were a kid? So I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do something in computing. Um, so I actually moved around a lot as a child. So I went to 11 schools in 12 years. Um, and the last move I did during my high school years was uh, in the middle of high school, I moved from Minneapolis to Atlanta. And the school I went to in Atlanta required you to do some sort of internship to graduate, like a sort of a practical experience job, job kind of like thing. And I told the person who kind of coordinated those things that I was interested in computing. And so they um, set up an internship for me and I went to meet with a person at, a, at this insurance company. So I went to meet with a person and it turned out what they wanted me to do was load tapes onto a tape drive all day, which didn't really sound all that much like software development, which is what I was interested in, but the guidance counselor didn't really know the difference. So I kind of scrambled at the last minute and my father was working for the Center for Disease Control at the time and he had a colleague down the hallway that could use some assistance in building some software. So I. I did that as a sort of a six week internship and then did that uh, for a couple of summers during high school. And um, then my the person I was working with moved to the World Health Organization in Geneva. That was kind of my summer job, developing software for epidemiology, uh, starting at the Center for Disease Control and then doing it at the World Health Organization. Um, and that was, that was fun and interesting. You know, I think uh, the software that I, ended up writing in high school and part of college ended up being kind of used pretty widely among the epidemiology community for doing sort of outbreak investigations of different epidemics for sort of just collecting statistics about healthcare and analyzing them. Um, 
And so I learned a lot in building that. I was kind of like doing everything on that product. So figuring out what features I should add and writing the code to do it. And it was a good experience. Yeah, you should have helped the, the World Health Organization with the Ebola crisis because it was in the news that they didn't predict it well. So, and so, do you think schools should do more to foster this type of education of computer science because, like, they have three core science courses: uh, physics, chemistry, biology. Should computer science be one of those, especially since it's the future? Uh, I, my view is, is people should be exposed to writing software and using computers in a computational way uh, earlier than they are today. You know, most people, if they're lucky, maybe get to take a computer science class in high school, but most people don't. And I feel like having some exposure to that would really help. I feel like, you know, a lot of, some of the people who have some experience with it in high school then kind of enter college at, more of an advantage if they start majoring in computer science because they, you know, basically a third of the class has like written lots of software to, as high school students and two thirds of the class has not had any experience. And it's a very weird kind of um, divergent set of, of backgrounds in a lot of these things. And I think that turns off a lot of people who haven't been exposed to it in high school because there's, you know, a third of the class is like kind of know it all at that point. Um, it's a big re issue with getting more women in computer science, I think, and uh, I think having basically everyone be exposed to this, even if they're not going to be computer scientists, is a pretty useful thing down the road. So what do you think uh, children should do or teenagers to get involved in this? Because lots of times it's the, the, the hardest step is the first step. So should it be taking courses through Udemy or having internships or learning through taking class at school? What's the best way for especially our teen audience to get involved? Um, I mean, I think there's, it'd be nice if it was something in the school curriculum, right? Like having just a, a course that introduce, introduces you to the idea of how you write computer programs, how computers behave at a low level. Um, and I think you can make that course pretty interesting. Like if you start less at the sort of theoretical algorithmic level, but start at the level of like, oh, it's your cell phone. You know, what's going on inside your cell phone? And you kind of dive deeply into some aspect of how a cell phone works or how, you know, Facebook works or how a Google search happens behind the scenes. These are things that people use every day and having some understanding of what's going on underneath the covers, I think would make people realize that there's tons of interesting problems and you can build completely new things by putting together different technologies and different kinds of approaches. But not too many days ago, they Google released TensorFlow, which is like an artificial intelligence thing. And so that's pretty amazing what they're doing. And like you, you could watch videos online and it says that it's trying to recognize a cat or others, like artificial intelligence. And you made it open source. What was part of the, what was the part of that decision that made you do that and what are the implications for the general audience like what could this mean in the future for us that what google can provide sure so yeah actually it was pretty exciting just last monday we released tensorflow which is this um, framework and programming model for expressing um basically machine learning kinds of applications uh machine learning systems uh we've been using an earlier predecessor system within Google for about the last four years. And the kinds of models that these systems really target are a special kind of machine learning model called neural networks, um, in particular very large and deep neural networks. So neural networks are sort of loosely modeled on, on uh, what, we, what little we know about how the brain works, where you have kind of these layers of abstraction that get built up and learned automatically. And each layer of abstraction kind of builds uh, on top of the lower level abstractions that have been learned. And so you, uh, it, a common domain in which these are used is computer vision models. So at the lowest layer, you might feed in something like an image and you want the model to produce as output, you know, what do I think is in that image? Is it a cheetah or a garbage truck or a, you know, a, a building. Um, and that's a really hard thing to program algorithmically, right? Like looking at pixel values, how do I tell if it's a building or a cheetah? Um, and so one of the really nice properties that these models have is that you can feed in labeled training sets 
basically images and then the desired output for that image. So you have an image, a picture of a cheetah, and you say cheetah, and a picture of a building, and uh, you say building, and you have a bunch of pictures of buildings from different angles, and they all say building. And gradually, the system can learn uh, through these hierarchical abstractions what um, you know what a building looks like, what kinds of things cause me to want to say that this thing is a building. And at the low level, these features, these systems learn features like, oh, this little patch of the image has a, an edge at this orientation or this orientation, or it's mostly green or a little bit of green with some red. Um, and then as you go up in abstractions, the system automatically learns more complex features, things like, oh, there's a corner or a cross-like thing or a cross with a bit of blue on one side. Um, and then as you build up even higher in these abstractions, you learn more complex features like, oh, there's a finger here or uh, like something that looks like an eye. Or, um, and as you get even higher, you have you know, very complex features that you would recognize even as a human, like, oh, it's a, you know, a yellowish flower in the center here or a human face from front orientation. And so Oh, and those things are sort of all completely learned automatically just uh, as in the process of trying to compute uh, uh, an approximation to this function, which is given an input, which is the image pixels, produce the output, which is you know one of a thousand different labels for the, the image. OK, and uh, were you just like me in the beginning when did you ever forget to put the semicolons at the end of the sentences, like on, at the lines uh, thing? Because that always happened to me in the beginning. I was wondering, did you like a natural prodigy, or did you always similar? Uh, no, no, syntax errors are a part of part of learning to program, I guess. It's uh, um, one of the nice things uh, is if you have a fast compiler, you you find your errors more quickly. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, and it was funny because I was reading online one of the jokes uh, for our audience that don't know. It's, it was an April Fool's joke, and they had lots of jokes about Jeff Dean. And, be, and it was one of them was Jeff Dean compiles and runs his code before submitting, but only to check for compiler and CPU bugs. Okay, so to move on to our lighthearted segment of the interview, would you like to participate in a quick game we always do? It's called This or That. You have uh, five seconds to think. Sure. Okay. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Cappuccino, phone? actually. Okay. Phone or computer? Ooh. Uh, uh, phone. It's the Super future. OK. Superman or Batman? Hmm. Superman, I think. I don't know. Gift cards or cash? Cash. Night owl or early bird? Night owl. Poets? Or quants? Quants. 1800s or the 1900s? Ooh. Um, 1800s. Milk or juice? Juice. Fire or ice? Ooh. Fire. It's more dynamic. And then I saved the very best for last. Of course, Microsoft or Apple? Uh, Apple. It's time to step it up and take it back. Time to push the train back on that long track. Wake up in the morning, what you see in the mirror? I see a kid making moves, not one made out of fear. Light a fire, set a flame, think big and think bigger. What's the fun in same old same? Why not go bigger? It's time to stand up, man. Time to stand up. Life is going by so fast. We gotta push forward and not get stuck in the past. The moment is here, the moment is now. Time to make a change, it's time to learn how. It feels like the world's changing every day. I believe we'll be the ones if we find a way. It's time to stand up, man, it's time to stand up. We'll make it anywhere by standing still. We'll make it to the peak without showing your will. Later becomes never, so watch it to do it now. Jump right in, takes time to learn how. Can't always wait for the perfect time. Gotta make you move, take a chance, not to step in the climb. It's time to stand up, man, it's time to stand up. Don't always need a plan, sometimes you just jump the past of the past, get out of the slump, build a door and step through, now make it a game, nothing happens if you don't try, no one to blame, take the next moment and make it your own, this is the one chance to make yourself known, it's time to stand up man, it's time to stand up. It's a matter of right and wrong, it ain't a matter of where we belong, be anywhere to sing that song, 
to carry that flag as you go along. Doesn't matter where you've been or where you're headed to. The walls you jumped over, the ones you ran through. It's time to stand up, man. It's time to stand up. Guys, I'm Zaha and this is going to be 60 seconds of interesting world news that you might not have known about. Let's get to it. Chennai, India has experienced a tragic flood with a death toll nearing 300 that has left thousands homeless. People are appealing to the religion of humanity and are opening their doors to people of all different backgrounds to share shelter and food. Another gender barrier has been broken down with the Defense Secretary Ashton Carter's announcement Thursday that he's opening all jobs and combat units to women. There will be no exception, Carter says. This means that as long as they qualify and meet the standards, women will now be able to contribute to our mission in ways they could never before. Meanwhile, Finland is considering to give every citizen a tax-free payout of 800 euros each month, which is equivalent to about 900 US dollars. This national basic income is aimed towards encouraging more people back to work as the unemployment rate is steadily increasing. Also, a young Austrian boy dived into a river in Vienna recently and rescued a huge sum of money. 100,000 euros, which is equivalent to 108,000 American dollars that were just floating by. There were no recorded crimes in the area, and the money is not counterfeit. We just don't know about its origins, but if the owners are not identified within a year, the money will be given to the boy. 28 private investors, including Microsoft's Bill Gates, have pledged to collaborate with 19 countries in order to fund research for developing new methods of harvesting clean energy. Mark Zuckerberg, with the birth of his daughter Max, has announced that he is going to give away 99% of his billions in charity organizations over the course of his lifetime. These are just a few tidbits of interesting events broadcasted to you from all around the world. I'm Shannon Madden, and today I'm here with Peyton Robertson. Hi, Peyton. So, Hi. <laughs> so I've heard, as a member of the OHS community, um, I've heard a little bit about uh, several of your patents that you've created. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Um, so yeah, I've had, um, I had, I actually just got my fourth patent on my retractable training wheels about a week ago. And, um, I designed those when my sisters were learning how to ride a bike. Um, you know, when they were learning, they were having trouble. They had to balance kind of that feel of getting, of riding on two wheels and balancing your body weight with safety. So I tried to create the best of both options with retractable training wheels. So you, um, you turn the handlebar control and they lift and you turn it back and they, um, and they go down. So, I mean, yeah, I guess that's useful. Um, it's the, it's, um, the fourth patent that I've gotten on that single, um, um, idea. I also have a patent pending on a golf ball temperature preserver. Um, well, I'm not going to pursue that one quite as much. And I also have an open patent on my sandless sandbag, um, which I was lucky enough to win the Discovery Education Thurium Young Scientist Challenge with. And that's kind of, um, the, I've kind of been pursuing that more as a science idea and the retractable training wheels is kind of more of a like business license kind of thing. Um, so yeah. So Peyton, how do you get inspiration for your ideas or innovation? Um, I guess I just look at the community around me. Um, I see the problems that people are having, whether it's in my family or in my city or even outside of that in the global community. Um, for example, with my retractable training wheels, I looked at um, my sister struggling to ride a bike. Um, for my golf ball temperature preserver, I looked at my own experience in a golf tournament and some of other people's data in similar situations. With the sandbags, I looked at first my local community um, and their emergency management department and the struggles they were having. Then you can go broader. You know, uh, I designed it about the time that um, Hurricane Sandy devastated New Jersey in the Northeast and. Um, Actually, last summer, I was on vacation to uh, New Zealand with my family, and a shopkeeper there had actually seen me on Ellen, and um, 
basically um, said like that she wanted to she wanted to have been able to use it for her shop when they had a massive flood um, in Christchurch, New Zealand, like in two thousand seven, I think it was. So, um, so it's amazing, kind of the influence that that um, that science and and research can have, and kind of the odd people who have seen different things. That's great. So where do you get your love of science from and how has OHS kind of helped to cultivate that? Uh, I've always enjoyed math and science and learning about how things work and making things work better. And as I've gotten older, I've been able to apply this to um, my local community and um, and beyond and things that I'm interested in and, uh, and want to change. I guess uh, in terms of OHS, it's allowed me to accelerate um, in the areas that I enjoy, like um, I'm taking AP Physics C right now um, and AP Biology uh, with you, Shannon, and um, bo both of those are um, both of those are classes that really allow me to um, to to pursue what I enjoy and learn more about the things that I'm interested in, um, even if they can be time consuming or difficult, but. Um, and yeah, and and then oh, it's it's but it's OHS is not only that it it's also well rounded. I'm taking a philosophy class, which I'm also enjoying, and Spanish, and and all, all the other things that that um, that an eighth grader should take. So Peyton, as um, as went along with the prize for you winning the competition for your stainless sandbag, you got to uh, participate in going on Ellen DeGeneres' show. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Uh, that was just amazing. Um, I wouldn't say it was part of the prize. Um, the prize was um, $25,000 for the college fund and a STEM trip to Costa Rica to study ecology. This was kind of the result of um, Discovery Education, who is the sponsor's ambitious PR department. Um, but it ended up being fun and it was great. I got to meet Iconopop backstage and I had no idea who there was and still don't care much about them, but I guess it was fun. Um, she was so funny. Um, it was, yeah, it was great. I didn't understand a lot of the jokes she made at the time, but um, but now, now I can definitely appreciate them and her show more generally um, as well. Um, but yeah, it was really cool. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Till then.